you may see early degeneration and early Alzheimer's or dementia. Because if the brain didn't have the right trajectory going up, it doesn't have the right trajectory going down. It's evolved because a living thing moved. Mm -hmm. And to move under your own power, um, as soon as you move, you need a brain to do that. If you don't move, if you just sit in the ocean and or you're just a plant that's sitting there, you don't need a brain. <laughs> so movement is what created brains and movement is what builds brains in children. Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, Health Junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Dr. Robert Melillo. We're going to talk about his Melillo method for helping kids and adults with autism spectrum disorders, ADHD, dyslexia, and even mental cognitive disorders. Wild stuff. So, what he talks about in this podcast kind of blows my mind because I love talking about the nervous system. But as a whole, we talk about how your childhood and a disconnect between the right and left brain development can create these neurocognitive disorders as you get older. So I know that my podcast is, is mainly geared towards adults, but hey, if things happen to us in our childhood and we're still experiencing symptoms like dyslexia, ADHD, hey, could we solve it in adulthood? Maybe. But maybe you have children or maybe you have grandkids or maybe you have loved ones that do have these disorders and you want to get them some answers. This podcast is for you in that case. Holy cow, I learned a lot here. So I know you're going to and it's a very fascinating podcast in terms of how this disconnect happens between the right and left brain. So let's introduce you to Dr. Robert Melillo. Dr. Robert Melillo, welcome to the Health Fix podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Gosh, I've been geeking out on your website and looking at neurological stuff a lot in my practice. Um, and, and really since before we hit record, like I was saying, there's a lot more people I'm seeing in my practice having ADHD diagnoses on meds and not really seeing results. So I have to always ask docs this question before we dive into the details. How did you get started becoming a doctor? What, what, what's your background story? What led you to this field and what led you to being a doctor? Yeah, there's kind of two beginnings, but you know, the uh, original beginning is uh, I was an athlete um, when I was younger and um, had a lot of different injuries as athletes do. And so I became interested in kind of sports medicine. And I also fell in love. I had an anatomy physiology course and uh, chemistry courses in high school, and I loved it. So, you know, that's what I knew I wanted to do really when I left high school. Um, but, you know, then I, uh, when I was in graduate school and I started out in chiropractic school, because for me, a chiropractor always helped me the most with any of my athletic injuries. So it made the most sense to me. But when I was there, I fell in love with neurology and with the idea of, again, a kind of a sports medicine approach to neurology. And so um, when I graduated, I, I, I took a, a diplomate course in neurology and became uh, board certified in neurology. And then I became board certified in rehab. And then later down the road, I got more interested in, um, in, I was teaching clinical neurology and I got very much into the brain aspect of it. And uh, I got a degree in a uh, master's in clinical rehabilitation neuropsychology and then eventually got a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. So I had kind of all of those things together. But what really clicked for me was, you know, when I was around 10 years in practice and I was doing really high level neurology and rehabilitation, and I was always into diet and nutrition, even as a, a young guy, you know, as an athlete. And so that was something I always did as well. Um, but I came home one day and there was this woman sitting at my, uh, my kitchen table with my wife and she was crying and my wife introduced me to her and she had met her at a party and her son had really severe ADHD. 
and um, it was something that was very upsetting to her. And she had tried, you know, all the traditional methods and, of course, medications, and none of them seemed to work, exactly what you just kind of said. And she wanted to know what were the alternatives. And my wife knew, you know, I knew a lot about neurology. I knew a lot about the brain. I was teaching it. I was doing, starting to do brain research. But I hadn't worked a lot with kids with ADHD. Um, so, uh, you know, I told her I'd look into it and I started doing some research and right off the bat, this was 1995 and there was a statistic that I heard on the radio that said the uh, use of Ritalin from 1990 to 95 had gone up 250% and no one knew really why. And then about two days later, I um, went to my child's first uh, parent teacher meeting, my oldest son. And we walk in and the teacher says, you know, I don't know how to say this, but I think your son has ADHD. And so now these two things kind of happen back to back. And, you know, as most parents, you know, and as a professional, I felt kind of embarrassed because I didn't know what it was. And I kind of thought, wow, you know, I, I should have picked this up. And then as a parent, like most parents, I felt like I was to blame because I was working a lot and maybe I wasn't home as much as I should be or whatever. And, uh, but, you know, I also had a question that popped into my mind, which was, well, what is ADHD? What is actually happening in the brain? Mm -hmm. And that was the most logical thing for me. And I went out and I started speak. I went to a number of my friends and colleagues and people that were like pediatric neurologists and neuropsychologists and psychologists and psychiatrists. And I, I asked them that question, what is actually happening in the brain in ADHD? And they all looked at me and said, I don't know. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe something with the frontal lobe or dopamine, but not really sure exactly what's happening. And then they said, but, uh, you know, you can't really do anything about it anyway. And I said, wait a second, you just told me you didn't know what it was. And, but you're really sure that you can't do anything about it, right? So I realized that I needed to really kind of jump in and figure it out myself. And, and that's what I did. I dove in and I spent, you know, the better part of 10 years just researching everything I could. Eventually, I wrote a textbook called Neurobehavioral Disorders of Childhood and Evolutionary Perspective and started doing um, things in my practice to work with kids with different issues and eventually started teaching it and then doing research on it. And um, then I started a company called Brain Balance Achievement Centers, where we had 150 centers around the United States. And and then the uh, ultimate evolution is this um, more advanced clinical model working with much more severe issues than just ADHD, like non-speaking autism or all different types of mental health issues at any age. And that's the Melilla method. And that's kind of my story synopsized. Oh, man. I mean, it, it does make it even more special, right? When someone close to us has something that we're like, what is going on? And, and you know, it's impressive how many kids are put into this bucket method and you know, not method, bucket diagnosis. And here's your meds and that's it, right? That's all we get. And this yeah. concept that you have of the disconnected kids, the disconnected brain is is fascinating to me. So tell us a little bit about how you started to explore more because, I mean, you've got multiple papers coming out. I, I'm fascinated by what you've been up to. How did you start to explore things with your son and with other kiddos? Yeah, well, you know, like I said, it started with that question, what is actually yeah. happening in the brain? So I dove into the research and books and I started reading books, you know, early in the, this was, early, like I said, mid 90s and First book I, I read was Driven to Distraction by Ned Hollowell, who I, you know, later in life, you know, I've actually met him and spoken to him. And he actually um, mentioned me in his latest book. And, um, you know, I, I really wanted to find out more. And in the book, you know, he talked a lot about different cases. But again, he didn't really talk about what was happening in the brain. So I really dove into the literature and really just got, you know, any major textbook or any major um, thing that I could find. And at that time, you know, Bill Clinton was the president and he declared the 90s the decade of the brain. So all this new brain research was coming out. 
And um, all of it was leaning towards a concept called functional connectivity, meaning that the old concepts of that there was a brain injury or there was a specific lesion in one part of the brain was no longer really being seen because with brain imaging, we could see there wasn't any obvious injuries, but yet there were obvious neurological and neuropsychological issues or learning issues. Um, so the idea that there was a problem really with connectivity in the brain where there wasn't any damage and there was uh, something called a disconnection syndrome where if there was damage or if they did something like they cut the white matter connection. So there's the gray matter, which is the brain cells and the white matter is basically the wires that connect those brain cells together. And um, if they cut the white matter, it, again, it would disconnect different areas of the brain without actually injuring the gray matter, but it would look like there was an injury to the gray matter. And then there became a concept called a functional disconnection where there wasn't any actual lesion of the gray matter or white matter, but there was a disconnection or a failure to communicate. And so, you know, I really wanted to understand what that was and why that was happening. And so that led to, you know, me looking at the literature. And there was also a lot of literature coming out even more on the hemispheres and how they worked and the differences of what they did. There was a book in like 1992 by a really big name researcher named Richard Davidson and a guy named um, uh, Kenneth Hugdahl. And it was called Brain Asymmetry, and it was a massive textbook on all the literature that was out there on looking at, you know, brain asymmetry and right brain, left brain. And it was really fascinating stuff. And, um, you know, one of the first concepts I read was that there was this thing called unevenness of skills where kids with, let's say, ADHD or in dyslexia, they didn't struggle in everything. In fact, they were often exceptional or even gifted in certain areas. So right off the bat, that sounded like some sort of imbalance and having a background in rehab, that kind of resonated with me. And so just kind of dove into it from there. Gotcha. Gotcha. You know, the background in rehab makes me think about even even just in the background in athletes trying to work on reaction time and, you know, jumping from one leg to the other. And I heard you mention in one of your, your talks about the Malila let me get this right, Melillo method, there we go, um, that that you you were working on different types of balance training and vestibular training as yeah. well. Yeah, you know, we looked at all the different systems because when you're talking about imbalances, like you said, in rehab, you know, you have these systems that are paired. You have the postural spinal system, which is paired, which I knew a lot about because I started as a chiropractor. And then also with the neurology of it, it was very involved with the vestibular system and then the oculomotor system and, you know, how that, how we see, but also how we perceive the world and the spatial world around us. And then that's paired with the cerebellum and then that's paired with the, the brain and the hemispheres. And so these, there were these systems that kind of developed segmentally and you know developed in that so looking at imbalances in someone's balance someone having a problem with balance was really an imbalance in their postural system or in their vestibular system or their oculomotor system or all three systems and the cerebellum and there was a lot of research again in that 90s and beyond that was looking at that in all kids with adhd and dyslexia and autism there was something underdeveloped in the cerebellum, that the cerebellum was one of the main areas. And it was known that they struggled with motor coordination, whether it was gross motor or fine motor. Many of them had, you know, visual or ocular motor issues as well. Um, and these weren't problems with the eyes. This was a problem with the brain. And so, you know, that is also very important. And even for my most current work, you know, because a lot of my work eventually evolved into you know, what's the most challenging thing? And the most challenging condition was really autism, especially non-speaking autism. And I really wanted to understand why they couldn't speak. And a lot of it is really related to um, the fact that they don't feel their body. 
They don't know where their body is in space. Literally, they don't feel it. And, you know, the vestibular system, as we're developing, it creates a map in our brain of our body. And so as we move through the world, even crawling, we start to create this map, especially in the right side of our brain for our whole body. And it was clear early on to some of the early research that these kids didn't feel their body and they weren't developing these maps in their brain and that that had something to do with preventing them from uh, from feeling their body and from speaking. And in fact, many times when we spin these kids, we can spin them a hundred times and they don't get dizzy. I mean, they can just stand up and walk like without any problem. So that, you know, that whole concept of looking at vestibular rehab and oculomotor rehab and spinal rehab evolved into really those same balancing principles into the cerebellum and the brain and and the networks that were associated with, you know, high executive cognitive function. Wow. So I'm imagining it's very fascinating in your office in New York to see you go through the series of what, you know, what to, to find the disconnection. Now, in in the in the nonverbal autistic child, what have you found to be the main disconnect for for them? What's kind of typical? I know not every person's the same, but what what would be a typical disconnect? Well, the main thing that we see in autism as in ADHD and OCD is really this underdevelopment or immaturity of the right hemisphere and overactivity or overdevelopment of the left. So that, you know, normally there's a timing to that. The reason why we having a right brain and a left brain is a great advantage because it essentially gives us two brains in one. I mean, it goes back to Ian McGilchrist, a very well-known psychiatrist uses this as an example where, you know, you get a bird and they are looking for a little seed on the ground and they have to look for every detail to be able to pick out what's the seed and what's the stones, right? But at the same time, you need to be aware that you might get attacked from a predator. So you need to be able to focus on basically the big picture around you paying attention. At the same time, you need to be able to look at detail and you need to be able to do those two things and that's kind of the description of the left brain and the right brain. And so it really is an advantage, but how does it develop? So the, you know, the right brain and the left brain develop and mature and become more and more specialized. And they need to become more integrated as we grow and mature. And that, you know, is unique to the human brain. We have the most asymmetric and in, and synchronized brain of any brain on the planet. And, um, you know, so what we see is that in the first three years of life, the right brain takes the lead in development. And it's mostly about connecting with our body, something called interoception. So we feel our body. A child needs to be able to tell a, a parent when they're in pain, when they're hot, when they're cold, when they're hungry, when they're thirsty, when they need to be changed, when they're tired. Uh, smell and taste are very connected to that. And so this is called interoception and that develops in that right brain early on. And that is what drives what's called nonverbal communication and then attachment. And the main job of that right brain is to attach to other humans because that's our number one survival strategy. Humans have to be connected with other humans to survive. In the Stone Age, you could not be out there alone, right? So, and if you were kicked out by a group, it was a death sentence. So re different emotions are associated in the right brain, like rejection sensitivity or embarrassment, shame, guilt, uh, fear, sense of danger, sadness. These are right brain emotions. And these emotions, you typically don't see them as much in people on the autism spectrum or even some people with ADHD or OCD because you see delays in that right brain development. And what we see is that it, it, what, what seems to be happening is that in that first three years, that right brain and that emotional regulation and social connection and nonverbal communication should be developing first. But in kids with uh, autism, they're unusually gifted with their left brain. I mean, basically, 
They're all geniuses with their left brain. And what happens is if something slows down the brain development, it may have more of an impact on the right brain and that left brain comes online too early and it then stops that right brain development. And then this creates this imbalance, which then creates a disconnect. And they usually have these overactive or exceptional genius level savant left brain skills and very, very underdeveloped right brain skills. And depending on what areas of the brain are involved, um, you know, that's what we see actually going on. And that's what we need to correct. And one of the main things is this lack of interoception. They don't feel their body, many of them on the non speaking end of it, on the on the really advanced speaking like Asperger's end of it, they may be hypersensitive to things, but on the low end, they don't feel it. They don't feel pain. They may not feel their body. They may not feel hungry or thirsty or full, or they don't feel hot or cold. And that's the main reason why they don't speak. Mm, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. So I'm guessing that your method is working on helping to develop the right brain. So drills or, or I say drills because I'm an exercise background too. <laughs> different yeah. things to to work on that right brain. Well, that's the thing. You know, I have a degree in psychology and neuropsychology and neuroscience and and chiropractic and diet and nutrition. And so I have a perspective from many worlds, right? And as you said, you know, like in the psychology world, they don't think about exercises. They don't think about physical rehabilitation. You know, they don't know about that. In the diet and nutrition and biomechanical, biochemical world, they don't think about those things. And they don't really understand, you know, psychology or the brain. And people in the OT or physical therapy, you know, world think about the physical body, but don't often connect that with what's happening in the executive functions or in the diet and nutrition. So, you know, I've developed this kind of uh, where I have all these different worlds that come together and you and realize that you need to look at all of them because they're all important. Um, diet and nutrition is very important, but it's not the primary issue. Um, and the primary thing that drives brain development is movement. Uh, movements are why we have brains. Um, in my first book, like I said, it was called Neurobehavioral Disorders of Childhood from an Evolutionary Perspective, meaning that we first looked at why do we have brains? I mean, how did brains evolve? And brains evolved because a living thing moved. Hmm. And to move under your own power, um, as soon as you move, you need a brain to do that. If you don't move, if you just sit in the ocean and or you're just a plant that's sitting there, you don't need a brain. <laughs> so movement is what created brains and movement is what builds brains in children. And anything that deviates from that movement because sensory stimulation stimulates the brain to grow, but motor activity drives that sensory stimulation. So the foundation of it is really movement and sensory. And that's the reason why we see such a huge dramatic epidemic of these things because with the advent of the computer age uh, we've been moving less and less and less at younger and younger ages and this is affecting our brain's growth and development and not only delaying growth but also leading to these imbalances in growth which then manifest later we know that essentially every adult mental health issue starts in childhood so, you know, it's all childhood, it's all developmental. That's why we work with all ages, but it's all developmental issues. And uh, what we've been able to find is that it's really linked to these things called retained primitive reflexes. Hmm. Tell us more, tell us more. Retained so, primitive you know, I know I didn't talk about that ever on this podcast. <laughs> that's been my area of research over the past several years. And as you said, we published, I think, seven papers last year alone. And most of it was on this large study we've been doing for the past four years at our lab, looking at something called retained primitive reflexes and their relationship to autism spectrum. And we did brain imaging and QEG and neuropsychological testing. And, uh, and then we did, you know, home training with people to get rid of these reflexes and to stimulate that right brain and we were able to show that we could significantly change 
uh, autism uh, in that. In, in as little as 12 weeks, we could measurably change it. So when we're born, the human brain is the most immature brain on the planet at birth. And that's because out of all primates, we have the b- biggest brain per body size, but humans have the smallest birth canal. So there's this kind of dilemma that the brain has to be kept kind of small before it's born. And when we're born, then it needs to grow like this explosive growth over the first three years. And so what we see is that the brain uh, the genes that direct brain development, which are 85% of our genes, are, are very sensitive to the environment because once they're outside of the womb, they need to know, okay, now I'm outside, now I can grow. And then they start getting bombarded by, again, light and sound and gravity and temperature and all the different experiences, and that stimulates the growth of the brain itself. So, you know, during that, those stages of development, what, what happens is, as we said, the movement kind of drives it, but we need to move, but the, a, a human child doesn't have control over their own movement. So they're born with these reflexes in the brainstem that allow them to first get themselves out of the womb. So like there's something called the asymmetric tonic neck reflex in a baby. If you turn their head or if they turn their own head, the arm and leg on one side will extend and the other arm and leg will flex. And so it's almost like a puppet on a string. You know, you move them. The tonic labyrinthine, if you extend the head, they extend their whole body. If you flex, they they collapse like, again, like a puppet. And those are there to literally help them twist down the birth canal and then kind of push themselves out of the birth canal And there's something called the spinal gallant, where if you stroke the spine, it will flex and that helps them wiggle out of the birth canal. And then it helps them to roll over on their belly and then crawl on their belly and then get up. And then they start rocking, which actually now activates something called the symmetric tonic neck reflex. And that inhibits the tonic labyrinthine reflex. And now they start doing a cross crawl pattern and they start to crawl and then they pull themselves up and then they walk on the furniture. And then at 12 months, they should walk and talk. And all those reflexes need to now be gone or, or integrated. And now it allows for much more complex movement and allows to build a much more complex brain. So it's like building the brain in layers from the bottom up. And then once you build the brain, it comes down and it regulates everything in our body, our immune system, our digestive system, our muscle tone, our sensory processing, everything is regulated by the brain. And what we were able to show, and other people have talked about this for many years, um, but no one's really proven it in research, is that there sometimes these reflexes don't go away. And if they don't go away, the question is, okay, what does that mean? What does that do? And what we were able to show is that what it means is that they should go away with maturity, but if they don't go away, the brain stays in a more immature state. And that's what we see in autism and ADHD and dyslexia is that the brain is is more immature. It's held back but then it can lead to an imbalance where the where one side comes online too early, like the left side in autism, and now that further holds back that right brain development, and that this develops this imbalance, and that creates that disconnect. So that these reflexes, um, if they don't go away, many times the child will miss or skip their motor milestones and they're very, very important. And in 90% of the cases that we see, these kids didn't hit their milestones either on time or in the right way, or they were very delayed in something, whether it was walking or speaking. And, you know, this is because these reflexes are still there. And by getting rid of these reflexes, we then allow the brain to grow, and then we need to do things to balance it out. And that is the answer. Wow. Wow. Can you find these reflexes in adults too? Absolutely. And it's pretty wild. I mean, I have videos. um, I think we posted some of 
Hey, Hell Junkies, struggling with sleep? As a former insomniac, I can relate. Devin Burke is a pal of mine. He has the Sleep Science Academy. He's been on my podcast twice, and we've talked a lot about how to work on sleep naturally, without supplements, without medications. Devin's program really does work with you to help you understand what is going on in your brain and body when it comes to sleep. And as a listener of the Health Fix podcast, he's given us a code for 10% off of his program, DRJ10. So if you're interested, use that. I highly recommend his program. So let's get back to the podcast. Um, you know, because I've been teaching for, I've been teaching a, a graduate level, you know, course, a fellowship level course to doctors and therapists around the world since 2002, uh, really since the early 90s I've been teaching. But so, you know, when I do this, um, it was actually interesting because in the early 2000s, it was really starting to do the research on these primitive reflexes. And there were other people out there like someone named Sally Goddard from uh, the UK who had already been, you know, talking about these things. And um, so I started, you know, finding them in kids in my practice. And I wanted to teach them in my course to doctors, but we didn't have any kids. So we started doing it on one another. And all of a sudden I realized that like probably at least 30 or 40% of them still had some of these reflexes. And there was almost, almost always at least one person in the audience that had all of them like fully there, like you would in an infant. And it was really wild. And then we were able to show that just by doing some hemispheric based stimulation, we could actually get rid of them temporarily and then bring them back if we did the opposite side. And that we could influence them by just doing some, you know, general stimulation to the brain, but in a very directed way. And so, yeah, you see this in adults. And again, I think any adult that I've worked with, with like bipolar or severe anxiety or depression, um, in most of them, they still have these reflexes. And that's where I say that this, this really goes back to childhood. Wow. So it's really popular right now, of course, to talk about the vagus nerve and trauma stuck in the body and all these different things. But really, we need to be looking beyond that, going back to, like you said, development and, and different developmental things that are going on. So get, get, let's let's take a step inside your office for a minute. Could you give us kind of an example of what you might do, what kind of things someone might experience if they came in, what kind of what kind of exercises or or, or treatments might you be doing so that folks can see what you're up to? Yeah, if you come into my office, it's one of the coolest places you would ever be, actually, because it's it's so futuristic. I mean, it's really the, you know, we, what I, I believe what we do, we're the best in the world. And, you know, it's also pretty busy and pretty crazy, meaning we have anywhere from, you know, infants coming in and we have a lot of, you know, the majority of, or at least probably 60% of what we work with are younger kids that are non-speaking with autism, but we work with everything and we work with adults, even with, you know, other issues. And, um, so, you know, we have like an adult side, we have a child side, we keep them somewhat separated, but you know, you'll hear kind of screaming and yelling and crying happening on one side and, and then adults working on the other, but when you come in, it starts with a really comprehensive evaluation that looks at really kind of everything. We do a complete neurological exam on everybody, and we're looking at, you know, are these retained reflexes there, which they are in the majority of cases of what we work with, whether it's children or adults. And then we look at, you know, is there an imbalance? And there is, you know, if there's retained reflexes, there's an imbalance. And if there's an imbalance, there's retained reflexes. Those two things go together. But then we also do lab work, you know, we're looking at blood work and we're looking at the balance of different immune factors like the TH1 and TH2 systems and, you know, looking at their breakdown of their white blood cells and in a very directed way, looking for antibodies against foods or against their own brain or against their own body. You know, 90% of the kids we work with with autism have eczema early on because their immune system is already dysregulated. Um, and they have issues with the balance of their sympathetic and parasympathetic. You know, everybody talks about the vagus nerve, but it's really way beyond that. The vagus nerve is just a nerve. It's really 80,000 nerves really put together, but it really is 
the conduit of the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's really what's most important. It's not just about stimulating the vagus nerve. It's about creating balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic system, which is ultimately regulated first by the brainstem, but then by the brain, and especially the right side of the brain has a lot more to do with the parasympathetic activation. Um, so, you know, you, we do this comprehensive evaluation. Then we also do cognitive testing. With kids, we do academic testing and neuropsychology testing. We also do QEEGs and brain maps in their brain. Uh, we do auditory testing and visual testing and processing testing. And we get a really complete picture of what's going on. You know, we put them through all these different exercises. We look at their core strength you know, their, their range of motion. We look at everything. And then we put together a program that's individualized that incorporates everything in it. So if you come into my office, you'd see rooms where, you know, we have monitors set up with specialized video games or virtual reality, or we're doing things like the interactive metronome that works with timing and rhythm and changes timing and synchronization while they're wearing, let's say, transcranial direct current units on their brain, creating balance while they have specialized glasses that are certain frequencies of colors that are blinking light at certain frequencies as they wear headphones that are play playing different frequencies of sound as they may be playing certain video games or virtual reality games that are geared towards right brain or left brain. They may be standing on a balance, on a balance board or a vibe plate. They might be doing, you know, uh, they have like a tens unit on them. They have different smells that they're doing at that point. Um, and then they do some sort of cognitive activity, whether it's academics in children or whether it's something like neurofeedback in adults. Um, and then, of course, we're always working with their diet and nutrition as well. So they'll come in and, you know, we may have eight or nine stations going at the same time, like, you know, three or four in the adult side, four or five. We have private rooms because some of the kids, when they first start out, they need to be in a private room. Um until they feel like, you know, it's comfortable for them, but then they like being in a room with other kids. And we have mats where they're doing exercises. We have them doing pull-ups. We have them doing push-ups. We have them doing balance work. We have them doing everything, spinning them in a chair with all the equipment on. We have lasers that are designed, uh, that I've designed protocols to work on specific parts and specific networks in the brain to create different frequencies because essentially that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create different frequencies in brain networks and get those frequencies to talk to one another. And we do that by slowing down networks on one side and speeding up networks on the other so that they can start to communicate and they can, they can bridge this disconnect. Mm -hmm. So the electrical activity we're working on the firing of the electrical activity and we're working on, you know, different communication makes, makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. How fascinating. Sounds like a day at your office would be super fun. So <laughs> it is. I'd love to get you there and actually put you through some of this stuff because you don't understand it until you actually experience it. And like you said, you know, Everybody, we've all been trained by the traditional medical world to think of things only in biochemical terms, right? That everything comes down to balancing chemicals in the brain. And that's not actually how the brain works. The brain, the chemicals are really a, 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 a you know, a messenger, but they're driven by, by electrical activity and by networks. And really there's a physics of the brain, right? The brain is uh, you know an, a complex one of the most complex systems in the universe so complexity theory and chaos theory and all of graph theory all of the way that the universe works is the same principles we have in our brain and and that's not like esoteric stuff that's the way it works and you know timing and synchronization you know being able to connect and communicate the chemicals are the chemicals and and very rarely do we actually see you know there's really no such thing as a chemical imbalance in the brain unless you have some sort of genetic mutation that affects you know the receptors in different areas but generally you know the idea 
that we have a problem with producing neurotransmitters is not really the way it works. And that's why people don't think about the, the brain more like a muscle. You know, the way you would train a muscle is the way you train a brain. If you want to train the auditory part of the brain and they have a problem with auditory processing, you need to do at least two things. One is motor activity, what we call proprioception, you know, balance, being aware of our body is kind of the master sense. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a book years ago talking about this, um, and it was based on research that if you took a kitten, and I'm not advocating this, but if you took a kitten from the day it was born, and you never let its paws touch the ground, so that it never would actually resist gravity, it would effectively be blind for the rest of its life. Wow. Now, we don't think about that because there's nothing wrong with the eyes, but we see with our brain, we hear with our brain. And if the brain isn't initially activated, it doesn't perceive anything, right? It can't perceive any sensory input. But so we need to do things on motor development and activity, but then we need to train the auditory system with sounds. And if we want to train vision, we need to train with light. If we want to train the way we feel our body, we need to do tactile stimulation or we need to exercise our muscles. If we want to work, you know, most of the kids that we work with, they don't have any sense of smell. Now, most of us became aware of this during COVID, but I've been looking at sense of smell for 30 years. And we know that that's a hugely important sense, especially for social and emotional development in people. And we see that the right brain has a lot to do with that, the left brain as well, but more the right brain. And that many of the kids that we work with and adults, they don't have a normal sense of smell. And you need to literally train that sense of smell. So you need to do training that's specific to that part of the brain, but there are multiple. I mean, when you got a kid that's on the ADHD or autism spectrum, they don't hear tone of voice as much. So they, they, they don't understand not social. They may not see facial expression. They may literally not see gestures. They don't see it. It doesn't really register in their brain because that area of their brain doesn't pick it up. So you need to train that area of the brain for them to be able to see it. But part of it is the visual system. Part of it is the auditory system. Part of it is the movement gestural system. And all three of those systems are usually impaired in autism or, you know, one of them or two of them may be more impaired in, in ADHD. So, you know, it goes beyond just looking at biochemistry and just and that is true in diet and nutrition as well. All of that is very important, but it's really secondary to what's happening in the brain. I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. That it's the electrical activity, I think, is where we've kind of missed the the mark on some of the things. But definitely taking a holistic approach like you do. I mean, I, I think that's the one thing we've segmented too much in the medical world, too. So it's good having the, the holistic approach along with everything else. Now... You've got a book coming out, another one. And and of course, we want to talk about that a little bit, Disconnected Kids. I'd love for you to kind of give us a little look into that. Is it somewhat like what you're doing at your your office, but on obviously a, a DIY scale? Or yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that book first came out in 2009, Disconnected Kids. And it was really the first book I put out there after my textbook that was really meant to put this into the hands of parents. Meaning, you know, once I realized that I was onto something pretty big that other people weren't seeing, and I was seeing the results in my office after 10 or 15 years of using it and collecting the data, it was pretty clear that what I was doing was working. And I wanted to, I felt obligated to get it out there. And I felt, you know, get it in into the hands of parents and give them a manual as to how to assess them, you know, and look at the things that I look at from my perspective and understand this right and left brain issue and then look at it again from the sensory motor system, you know, looking at vision and hearing and, and movement and looking at these things like primitive reflexes and then look at their academics 
and then look at their nutrition and their and their biochemistry and then put together a program and follow that program through. And so from the beginning, that bit, the book has been a really big hit and um, it really resonated. So it's, you know, one of the best selling books in that genre. And so fortunately, now we have the third edition coming out, which it's in 18 languages around the world. Mm -hmm. And um, it just keeps on getting more and more and more popular because more and more people are having these issues and also more and more people are interested in the brain. You know, I was at a conference recently and the conference organizer started out by saying that the number one Google search, search term in the healthcare field right now, the number one in the world is brain health. So there's an interest and I think, you know, my work has been kind of uh, on the cutting edge and I've always updated it. So now we're coming out with the third edition, which really includes a lot of the research that we've done over the past five, six, seven years on these primitive reflexes. And we've really expanded that section out as well as really the understanding of, of what's actually happening in the brain in more detail. But it's still a model that we want, you know, for parents or for prof even professionals will often use this book. But, you know, it's, it's really a, a, a still a, a relatively simple version compared to what we do in my office with the Melilla method, because that was what was called the brain balance program. And that was my first, you know, step into it. And but then, you know, I wanted to work with even much more severe issues and with adults and not just kids and understanding that these were developmental. And so, um, you know, and, and many people need a lot more. They need a lot more, more advanced medical interventions. And so, you know, we talk a little bit about that in the, in the new edition, but it's still really geared as a manual towards parents and families and you know it's published by penguin who's the largest publisher in the world and you know I, I feel really fortunate that um this book you know after 15 years is is more popular than it's ever been before and uh and that we get to do a third edition that's awesome that's awesome no i think you know the melillo method and even looking at the brain balance program for the kids i mean i think i think it's huge to be able to have like a something for providers like myself to be able to dabble in and then, you know, be like, okay, maybe they need to come see you in person. But I think it's also great for parents who are struggling, grandparents who are wondering what to do with, with their grandkiddos. But also I'm guessing because you had said you could use this, these reflexes on adults too and see if they're still there. So even though it says disconnected kids, we can still apply it to adults too, correct? Yeah, and that's why, you know, our center on uh, in Long Island, and we're, we're going to be opening in another one in New York City at the end of this um, uh, summer, um, is called the Center for Developing Minds. Because, you know, our minds are still developing probably at least until we're 40. Um, you know, the research kind of says the brain is still growing up till 25, but that research didn't look beyond 25, so we know that the brain is still myelinating up until 50. So it's probably still developing. And what we see is that, you know, some things may show up in early childhood. You know, autism, you usually see it within the first three years. ADHD within the first six years. Dyslexia within the first, you know, 10, 12 years. And then beyond that, we know schizophrenia normally shows up in the 20s. Um, I see bipolar very commonly in the 30s. Um, and then, you know, other other issues later on in life. I mean, so uh, again, it's to a certain extent, it wasn't really what I was thinking when I first wrote this, but now disconnected kids, meaning that even in adults, it was really our brain got disconnected as a kid and that's still impacting us now and it may not show up. Uh, and I believe that that may even be the reason why we may see early degeneration and early Alzheimer's or dementia, because if the brain didn't have the right trajectory going up, it doesn't have the right trajectory going down. And so if it doesn't come up as sharply, if it comes up lower than it should, 
it degenerates earlier than it should. So I think that even, you know, things like Parkinson's and neurodegenerative disorders often start in childhood and, and are often related to these retained primitive reflexes. Hmm. That's fascinating. That is fascinating. So of course my next question is like, all right, so for all of us who are like, hmm, you know, maybe I, I need to check out all of these reflux and see if they're there. What would be, and, and I'm just curious for you, for yourself, what, what are some of the things you practice every day to help with brain health? Just to give everybody else a little sense of like what might be something they want to look at. And then also reading the book to find out what they're, because I'm curious what my primitive reflexes are that I, that I may have retained. I'm very fascinated now. Yeah. You know, I'm always kind of looking at, um, First of all, uh, you know, I think the most important foundational thing is physical exercise. We have to physically move our body. And so I've always exercised my whole life. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, got into running at a certain point because I felt like that was really important for me to, to do that. But also strength training, all of that is important. But I'm also looking at my own imbalances. Like even as I'm looking at you and I'm looking at myself on the screen, you know, I have a little bit of a head tilt sometimes to the right. I can see that, you know, the crease on this side is not quite as deep as the crease here. You see that my mouth goes down a little bit on the left side. My uh, one eye may be a little bit bigger than the other. And these facial asymmetries is an incredible window and you may not see it when you look in the mirror, but if you take a picture of yourself and you look at it, all of a sudden you may see this facial asymmetry where one eye is a lot bigger than the other. And that facial asymmetry is an incredible window into your brainstem and your brain. And if you have this, you know, big asymmetry in, in your face, you also have usually some sort of asymmetry in your brain but also in your autonomic system, because when we talk about that parasympathetic sympathetic system, you know, the nuclei that regulate that balance are in the brainstem and part of and the parasympathetic nuclei called the nucleus ambiguous. That is the most evolved part of that vagal system that regulates the gut and digestion and the release of acid and enzymes and blood flow and absorption and regulates the immune system to create anti-inflammation. So to reduce inflammation in our body, all of those nuclei, that balance of it are in the lower part of the brainstem. And that nucleus ambiguous is what creates tone in your facial muscles. So if you have an imbalance or like if one pupil is bigger than the other, um, then you have an imbalance not only in your brain and in the muscles of your face, but most likely you have an underdeveloped vagal system and you may have digestive problems and not, you know, malabsorption and vitamin and mineral issues and too much inflammation in your body, which as we see is again, kind of epidemic in these days and day and age. So, you know, looking at that, and then I, I do, obviously I'm very aware of my diet. I take supplements every day because, you know, we also want to keep our immune system in balance. There's, you know, two parts of our immune system as well, like what's called the TH1 and TH2 systems. And there's different vitamins, there's different foods, there's different supplements. So I'm looking at all that. And then I, I pretty much, I try to read something almost every day, whether it's a book that I'm reading or whether it's a, a, a scientific paper. So I try to do something every day for my body physically. What I eat, I'm very aware of it. I take supplements and specific for my needs. And I do, you know, blood, blood work regularly so that I can check my own markers to see what's going on there. Mm. Wise advice. Wise advice. Yes, the face um, and the eyes. And I always, my one here, my left one, I'm always like, hmm, okay, something's up over there. So I think I need to do some training to figure out what I'm, what I'm going to do to get myself lined up here so we can avoid some stuff in the future. Well, you know, you have to look at it based on, you know, we all have certain strengths and weaknesses. And, um, you know, that's normal. And I think all of us are either a little bit more right brain dominant in our cognitive style, the way we think about things, the way that we view the world, the schema 
we have. You know, the left brain is much more analytical and logical and sequential and looks at every detail and is very motivated and driven, um, you know, that type A personality type thing. Um, someone who's very organized, someone who's very intellectual, someone who usually does really well academically that may be, you know, very good either, you know, verbally or reading books or with math or numbers or engineering or, you know, that left brain style that we see that that's the trait that we see in the parents or in the families of kids with autism and ADHD and OCD and those left brain dominant type of uh, issues. And the right brain is really much more big picture. It sees everything all at once. Again, it's more about nonverbal communication, social interaction, forming relationships, maintaining relationships, regulating our body and our emotions and our stress systems and inflammation. Um, you know, being able to see that, you know, be more connected to the real world and nature. Um, the left brain doesn't really care about people very much. The left brain prefers to be by itself. The left brain likes more of a virtual world, not really the real world. It prefer to be in a virtual game than in, you know, in the woods. Um, the right brain we say is creative. Both sides of the brain are creative, but the left brain likes familiarity. It likes to do the same thing over and over and over and over. So an extreme version of that is OCD or, you know, having to stick to routines all the time, not transitioning to new things well. Um, the right brain likes novelty. So the light, right brain is looking for things that it's never seen before because that could be potentially dangerous. Um, but so the idea of creating something new that no one's thought of before is really the right brain. And the right brain is very physical. It likes moving the body. So people that are athletic or dancers or kinesthetic are typically very right brain dominant. People that like things like design or inventions, um, you know, or people that are very good at music or like songwriting or art or painting or socialization, people that are incredibly good at reading other people or that are overly empathetic. Too much of that may lead to a lot of incredible social anxiety around feeling like being judged or over reading other people's facial expression. And, and the right brain tends to be more negative in many of those things. So, you know, people that are very creative or in the art world, um, I, I just did a podcast with my daughter, who's a singer songwriter in, in Nashville, who's incredibly talented, but huge right brain. But she struggles with some of this anxiety and all of these creative people down in Nashville, all of her friends all struggle with the same thing. But also she was borderline dyslexic. So a lot of people that are very big right brain are dyslexic because of the imbalance. So like Thomas Edison was dyslexic. Ed Sheeran is dyslexic. Um, you know, many athletes I've worked with are dyslexic. So you know, these are the fascinating things about looking at the right brain and left brain and understanding it. And really, there was a famous neuroscientist named Tim Brown that said nothing in human psychology or psychiatry makes sense unless you look at it in bright light of brain asymmetry. Hmm. Wow. Wow. I hope this has given folks a new perspective in terms of brain health and brain and cognition. And of course, as we get older, you know, working on keeping the mind right and preventing things, not, you know, the whole concept of Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's starting as a, a, in childhood and then us being able to work on things to prevent them. Like, wow. My yeah. It's real important because, again, people just think, well, all I need to do is maybe change my diet, which is very important. But, you know, it's more than that. Physical activity is the most important. Um, but then also interpersonal relationships. You know, um, there was a Harvard study, the longest study ever done in psychology, 75 year study where they looked at two groups of boys, one that who, got, who had gone to Harvard uh, College at the time, and then local boys that were more poor. Um, and they followed them out for 75 years, interviewed their, their wives, their friends, their grandchildren, their children. It was an extensive study. And they wanted to see, you know, what was the, what were the things that related to happiness, 
and success, right? Or health, really happiness and health more than anything. And they found that, you know, it wasn't money, it wasn't material wealth, it wasn't education, it wasn't your job, that the number one factor for health and happiness later on in life was the quality of your interpersonal relationships, which is really all right brain. There's a great researcher named Alan Shore. He's the head of the Geffen Institute in uh, UCLA. And he has done a lot of work on the right brain development. He has a recent book called The Development of the Unconscious Mind. And it's all about the importance of right brain development uh, in, in emotional and social development and interpersonal and attachment and how when it doesn't develop that it's really the core of almost every major mental health issue that we see um, in children and in adults. Um, and it's so important. And that is something that we're moving towards a left brain world. There's, uh, a, a, I mentioned it before, Ian McGilchrist is a very famous uh, psychiatrist from the UK who's written a lot about brain asymmetry as well and the importance of it in mental health. And he wrote a book called The Master and His Emissary that he talked about how we've been moving more and more into this left brain world and it's creating all these different sicknesses, you know, like mental health issues, but also, you know, division. The left brain only really has the only primary emotion of the left brain is anger. So we see that people are more angry, people are more divided than ever. You know, people are more, you know, uh, self-centered. People don't care about nature as much. They're not, you know, all the good things that we have, moralistic, is all right brain. And the left brain is all good from a standpoint of, you know, doing things and getting things done and acquiring things. And, you know, uh, all of that is left brain and that's good. But if we're just driven by this left brain world, that's technology and everything, it's creating so many problems in our health, in our mental health, in our emotional health, and mainly having a real impact on interpersonal relationships. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Oh my goodness. So I guess we all need to be working on on this balance. And I, I'm kind of like, I think this should be fun, foundational to to practices, especially to kind of help folks live live longer, but connect better, maybe make a better world. <laughs> so yeah. That's where I'm kind of leaning towards after what you described just now. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So much good stuff. So much good stuff. <sighs> so we got to tell folks where to find you. You said right. Long Island, so we know we know roughly there. But let's let's help folks find you online. Let's help find folks yes. connect with you, Doctor Melillo. Yeah, so robertmelillo dot com is my website. Um, Doctor robertmelillo dot com. Um, that's M E L I L L O um, at. Uh, Dr. Robert Melillo is my Instagram. I have a really active Instagram. So a lot of these things I show, you know, images of them and videos. And so, you know, my Instagram is pretty active and, 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 and we really put a lot of stuff out there for people to help people. So that's a really good place to go. And so Facebook and Instagram and, and on, uh, on Twitter. So they can reach me through all of those things. My wife and I also did a web series through, uh, um, a, 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 a network called Your Home TV that was started by Kathy Ireland. Oh. And uh, it's called Disconnected Kids, Reconnected Families. And we have over 4 million views in, um, in less than a year. And it uh, really shows going into people's homes and working with, you know, there's two seasons of it. So that's something. And then we just also put out a podcast that's available on Spotify and Apple. It's called Melillo Method Podcast, Everything Brain. Uh, we have two episodes that are out. We're coming out with another one uh, next week so people can listen to that. And like I said, I have a very active practice in New York uh, on Long Island. And now we're opening one in New York City as well. Fascinating. I think that in person, I think I'm like medical tourism, guys. <laughs> so go visit Dr. Robert. That sounds fascinating. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Such great info. And gosh, my, my mind is like going now. I'm like, huh, I need to know all these reflexes now. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the foundation. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It was great being here. Thank you. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, 
please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.